Forgive us, Father God, for messing up. Forgive us for falling short. Forgive us for not doing those things that are pleasing in your sight. We pray that you bless us tonight as we dive into your word, that your word will become real to us, that your word, Father God, will set us on fire, that people will come from miles away just to watch us burn. Burn to glorify you. 
burn to Father God to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. So in the precious, powerful, anointed name of Jesus of Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God for it. God has done great things for all of us in this room. Amen? Amen. And he's still blessing us in spite of us. In spite of our mistakes. In spite of our frailties. In spite of all that we're going through, God is still blessing us. How many of y'all deserve to be blessed by God tonight? Raise your hand, raise all your hands way up in the air if you deserve to be blessed by God. Matter of fact, if you deserve to be blessed by Him, get up and run around the room if you deserve to be blessed by the Almighty God. God has blessed us, and we don't even deserve it. God has tremendously blessed us. Hallelujah to the Lamb. In our book, Experiencing God, we are on page number 17. Page number 17. How many of you have assignments from last week for your reading? Where are you, Sister Darrington? Um, uh, I'm at the beginning. The beginning uh, of? the second paragraph. The second? Uh, with, if you have been working. Page 17? Who who's who has the part in the clinic? Maybe that's the question I said. Mr. Whitlock, right? Who has number four's paragraph? Number four, page 18, number four. Who has that? Was Brother Whitlock the last person? I had the one underneath four, starting to be God served. Right, that's what I mean. Okay, Sister Whitlock has number four. I have the questions. I have the questions. She has number four. Who has number five? On page 18. Me. Me? Who is me? Sister Darren. Sister Darren. So you're starting on page 19 with Elijah, correct? No. I'm yeah. 18. She's on 18. She's hmm? the second paragraph after me. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, so you have, if you have been working, correct? Okay, who has number five? I have number five. What you have, Sister Sister uh, Richard? Elijah. Elijah on page 19, correct? Yeah. And that's about as far as we can make it. Who has ditched Elijah or God? I did. All right. All right. We got it. Amen. <laughs> My sister would like to actually read the scripture, 1 Kings 18, and those verses in there on page 18. Okay? So everybody has that assignment? Yes. Sister Davis Davis, if you would come. Sister Davis Davis. Amen. Amen. The one that forgot she was Sister Davis Davis. Amen. Bless the name of Jesus. Amen. So tonight we're going to talk about a cup. Y'all look how y'all looking at me. Tonight we're going to talk about this cup. Okay. Throughout tonight we're going to talk about this cup. And if you studied, you know why we're going to talk about this cup. So, Brown, are you ready to tell us why we're going to talk about this cup? Why are we going to talk about cup in Bible study? Well, let me point some things out. This cup has been molded by the potter. This cup has been formed. This cup has been made by its potter. This cup has been put together by its maker. This cup has been colored. It's not a blue cup, it's a purple cup. It's not a white cup, it's a purple cup. It's not a green cup, it's a purple cup. This cup has been formed, shaped, and colored by the pot. This cup is in my hand. Right now, this cup is in my right hand. Now, this cup is in my left hand. 
Now this cup is in both my hands. The cup didn't move from one hand to the other. I moved the cup. This cup, Brother Taylor cannot do anything but what I do with it since it's in my hand. Matter of fact, this cup doesn't even want to move. It just does what I do with it. This cup will stay in my hand as long as I have this cup in my hand. The cup has no choice. But the deal is, you have a choice. But you need to understand, you've been shaped, you've been formed, you've been made, you've been molded by God your maker. You even been colored by the God you make. Whatever color you are, no sense in trying to bleach yourself. No sense in trying to get a tan because when the winter comes, it's going back to the same color. This cup is the size it is and it's going to stay this size. No sense in you trying to make yourself different. This cup has been formed by its maker, has been colored. How many of you proud of the color you are? I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> Anybody proud of the color they are? Yes, Anybody glad to be the color you are? That's right. Don't you know that your maker didn't make mistakes? My point of ears was made by the maker. My long nose was made by the maker. Some people who have flat nose, their nose were made by the maker. No sense in you go and get any plastic surgery. It just is what it is. Some people have skinny nose. Some people have wide nose. Some people have big lips. Some people have small lips. The maker has put you together. And I want to tell you tonight, he did an awesome job of putting you together. The problem with us is, unlike the cup, we won't stay in the master's hand. Okay, Brother Whitlock, tell us about the potter in the clay. About the potter in the clay. Brother Whitlock, can we educate us on the potter in the clay tonight? All right, the potter in the clay, I'll read the uh, scriptures first. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah verses 1 18, through 6. Verses 1 through 6. Jeremiah 18. Verses 1 through 6. Verses 1 through 6. And it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause, I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Yes. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. And now for the section in our book. Page 17 is where he is at the very bottom of the page where it says potter and clay. Yes. Potter and clay. My understanding of a servant is depicted by the potter and the clay. And we just read the scriptures, Jeremiah 18, 1 through 6. The clay must do two things. Number one, the clay has to be molded. It has to be responsive to the potter so he can make it into an instrument of his choosing. Number two, the clay has to remain in the potter's hand. When the potter has finished making the instrument, it has no ability to do what it wants. It must remain in the potter's hands to be effective. Suppose the potter molds the clay into a cup. The cup has to remain in the potter's hands so he can use that cup to fulfill its purpose. All right. 
top of page 16, I mean 18, I'm sorry. These characteristics are quite different from the world's view of a servant. When you come to God as his servant, he first wants you to allow him to mold and shape you into an instrument of his choosing. Then he takes your life where he wills and works through it to accomplish his purposes. Just as a cup cannot do anything on its own, you do not have the ability to carry out God's will except to be where he wants you to be. Amen. Amen. Let's talk about it. I started off by talking about a cup, right? So as the author talks about a piece of clay, a cup, he gives us an indication that the cup is more obedient than human beings. I'm telling you, this cup is more obedient than human beings. Anybody want to contest that? Anybody wants to deny that? Anybody wants to say no to that? Now, this cup can't think. <laughs> this cup can't walk. <laughs> this cup can't move on its own. But this cup seems to know where to be and where to be at the right time. Somebody tell me about human beings. How does human beings compare to this cup? The author talks about a good servant. He says that the potter was making, when you look at the entire text, it says that when, when Jeremiah went to the potter's house, he saw the potter there and he saw the potter on a wheel and this clay was turning on a wheel. And as the clay turned on the wheel, whatever the potter shaped is what the cup came out to be. God is shaping us. But we don't want to be in that shape. God is molding us. But we don't want to be in that mold. We've already concluded in our mind, God, this is what I want to be. This is what, matter of fact, we've concluded, God, this is what I'm going to be. But the cup, the cup says a God's example for us. Number one, the cup understands who its maker is. Number two, the cup takes on any shape that the maker puts it in. Number three, the cup does nothing more or nothing less than what the maker makes the cup to do. How does that compare to human beings? Anybody? Is there any comparison? Well, maybe the question should be, what is the contrast to human beings? Are we smart? Are we are intelligent? Sister Brown, tell us something about human How is the contrast? Let them use the word contrast. Well, the cup does not have a mind and a spirit, uh -huh. whereas human beings do. Uh -huh. And we want to do what our mind tells us to do. Oh, okay. And so the cup will just be. Okay, so we got a mic. Let's pass that mic back there. <laughs> let's let's see. Let's see what she's saying so the audience can see what they're saying so they can write on the screen. She ain't right. But anyway. <laughs> the cup will be whatever the potter makes it. And whatever uh, characteristics the potter gives that cup, it will be that. Human beings, we have our minds and our thoughts, and we sometimes, a lot of times, think <laughs> that we know what we want to be, what we mm -hmm. want to do, how we want to do it, and so we want to do it the way that we want, not necessarily the way the potter. Mm -hmm. So who is the potter when it comes to human beings? God. God is the potter, right? Yeah. He's already shaped us. He's already formed yeah, he already us. Just like we are. I'm telling you, be proud of who God has made you. Whether you get 600 likes or not, be proud of who God made you. You see, we used to have peer pressure in the classroom and peer pressure on the playground. Now we've got peer pressure on social media. We have peer pressure and pure pressure. Peer, P-E-E-R, P-E-E-R. E R, peer pressure. 
meaning folk like us put pressure on us. But we have pure pressure, P-U-R-E, meaning that we're being pressured from every side. And sometimes pressure is good, but we got to stay in the potter's hand. We grew up in the backwoods of Mississippi. They said, Mama, that's, that's dirty. She said, all that doesn't kill you, make it fat. <laughs> when you go to the gym, they said, no pain, no gain. In other words, those things that we know will hurt us, sometimes God is using that pressure to make us whole and make us who we ought to be. The circumstances that you've been through, God is shaping you in this stuff. The things that you don't like about you, God is molding you to who you ought to be. The things that you're going through, God is preparing you for your great future. And everybody in this room got a great future ahead of you. You have a future ahead of you that no one like you has ahead of them. Let's look. He says that the clay has to adhere to two things. Number one, the clay is going to be molded. When we look at a cup, the cup has gone through some things. When we look at the cup, the cup has been molded. So the clay has to be molded into a cup. And the clay is always responsive to the potter. Are you always responsive to God? Anybody in the house? Raise your hand in the air. Wave them like you just don't care. Are you always responsive to God? I say we are always responsive, whether we positively responsive, responsive or negatively responsive. But in this case, the clay is positively responsive to the potter. The clay does what the potter says to do. So he can make it into an instrument of his choosing. What is he talking about? Make it into an instrument of his choosing. Does the clay become an instrument of the clay's choosing? The clay becomes an instrument of the potter's choosing. I was born black. When I was born, I was born a Negro. That's what my that's what my my birth certificate say. Anybody else in the room have Negro on their, their birth certificate? I can look at the people in this room and tell you what people have Negro on there. I can look at the people in the room and I can tell you what you got on your birth certificate. I guarantee you. How many people were born before 1965? Uh-huh. I see. I see. I see. Okay, how many people have got Latino on their birth certificate? How many people have Hispanic on their birth certificate? How many people have African American? If you got African American on your birth certificate, that tells me your age. Yes? Tell me how young you are. How many people got mixture on their birth certificate? How many people got other on their birth certificate? Anybody got mixture on their birth certificate? How many people don't know what's on their birth certificate? <laughs> you, you hadn't looked at it since 1970? <laughs> we have to understand that we have to be what God has made us to be. This new technological world in which we live make us want to be something we're not. How many people know, not you, but folks somewhere else, how many people know somebody who, for, who have forgotten from which they've come? They think they're more than what they came up to be. Anybody? How many people don't want to be recognized who they are? When children get around 13, they don't want mama kissing them in front of the school anymore. Oh, mama, that's nasty. They don't want to be who they've been for the last 13 years. So the clay is responsive. The clay is molded. And the clay is the instrument that God has chosen that clay to be. Your brain cells, every, God knows every last one of them. The hairs on your head and the hairs that used to be on your head, God knows it. 
So Sister Richard looked at me and bust out the laugh. God knows the instrument he wanted you to be, and God has made the best choice for you. Parents said, look now, look now, I fed you, I clothed you. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. But check this out. Once you have been fed, clothed, once you grow up, you become who you want to be. You can't blame your mom and dad for any of that. However you things you accomplish, how many things that you become, how many places you go, whatever you get involved in, whatever you get into, is not their fault. You don't believe me? Take notes and write down John chapter 9, John chapter 8. There's a blind man. The Bible says Jesus spit on the ground, made clay, and put it on the blind man's eye, and they began to question him. Who is the person that made you see? You were blind from birth. And then they go and ask the parents, and the parents are scared to answer because of the government. So the parents said, he's of age, meaning he's old enough, ask him. <laughs> and the blind man says, a man named Jesus took clay and put on my eyes, and I was once blind, but now I see. Ooh, good God Almighty, that's the testimony right there. So the clay becomes what the potter makes it to be. So the first thing is, the clay is molded, the clay is responsive, and the clay is the instrument of the potter's choosing. Number two, the clay has to remain in the potter's hand in order to be successful. I'm telling you, if you get out of God's hand, you got a problem. If you refrain from coming to God and coming before God, you're going to have an issue. Matter of fact, you're going to have a whole lot of issues. You better stay in God's hand. When you look at Romans chapter 1, uh, the Bible talks about how God will turn you over to a reprobate mind. And it's not just talking about homosexuals. It says God will turn you over to a reprobate mind. What is he saying? If God turns you over to a reprobate mind, what is he saying? God will let you do you. God, you know, that's the thing now. I'm glad you said it. That way. That's the thing now. Let me do me. And when folk get tired of you, guess what they say, young lady? Go and do you. <laughs> they, they said, go and do you. Now, in my day, when I was a teenager, they would say, look, I'm done with you. And they say, I'm Mississippi done. Do you in done? I'm done. It's a dangerous thing if your parents tell you, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. It's a dangerous thing if the preacher tells you, I'm done with you. It's a dangerous thing if the church comes to the conclusion that they can't help you. It's a dangerous thing. So in Romans chapter 1, it talks about God turning you over to a reprobate mind. Meaning you go on and do what you want to do. And when they say it, this is how the old folks say, go on now. Just go on, go on, go on. Go on, do what you're going to do. Do you, is what they were saying. And when they take their hands off you, you know you're in trouble. Yeah, know that's, right. that's why everybody needs a pastor. Everybody needs a pastor that can touch them. Everybody needs a pastor that can, can pray for them. Everybody needs a pastor that can minister directly to them. Because you need somebody in your corner. You need somebody that, that's praying for you. You need somebody that's covering you. We got to get off that jump talking about, oh, he's just a man like I am. He put on his bridges the same way I do. That's not the point. Because I told you, sometimes you call on me, I can't put on my bridges the same way you do. I have to take a running start, stand my bridges up in the middle of the floor, take a running start, and jump into both of them at the same time and come on, see what you need. <laughs> When I grew up, I, we had to starch our pants or they stood up by themselves. So at the end of the day, we have to be godly, not just spiritual. We have to be godly about everything we say and do. Because everybody, this cup has been in my office some 15 years. 
and it had a covering over it. Why did it have a covering over it? When I get it, I'm going to wash it out, I'm going to clean it off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clean it up before I use it. But the whole time this coat was in there, it had a covering over it. It had a covering over it. Every person, like this cup, like the clay, every person needs a covering. You need a church home. You need a pastor that can feel your pain. The cup stays in the potter's hand. How many people you know? Not, not at this church, but at other churches. How many people you know have gotten just flat mad over little stuff and left their church? How many people have just walked away from God and uses COVID-19 as an excuse? <laughs> they go on every, every family reunion, every sporting event. But I ain't going down there to that church. Though. They concluded that they manufactured COVID-19 at the church. You're right, baby. Say amen. <laughs> They are manufacturing COVID. COVID-19 didn't come from China. It came from the church is what they've concluded. We have to get to a point where we understand that we have to stay in the hands of God. And church attendance and church assembling is in God's hands. It's what God wants. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25 that we must stay in God's hand and we must assemble ourselves together. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so does one brother to the other. Have you ever wondered why we have a prayer list? And our prayer list is in the church. Why ain't the prayer list down at the club? Why the prayer list is not posted on the door in the pool hall? Why the prayer list is not posted on the rockets in the, the Texans locker room? Because when you need prayer, you don't go to them, you go to the church. Yes, you go to the church because the church is the one who talks to God on your behalf. I'm telling you, just stay in the potter's hand. Stay in God's hand. When the potter is finished making the instrument, it has no ability to do what it wants. The cup, it has to stay right where I put it. That cup didn't jump off of this countertop. I sit it over here and then move back where I was, where it was. That cup don't stay where it is. We have to realize that if we stay in God's hand, we can make a difference. Matter of fact, this cup is pretty much useless until I put a substance in it. Once I put a substance in it, the cup does what I want it to do. Not only does the cup do what I want it to do, the cup takes on liquid and it shapes the liquid. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The cup shapes the liquid. And the liquid has to do what the cup says to do. We're in this world. We're not of this world. We have to do godly things. It says, it says that the, it has no ability to do what it wants. It must remain in the potter's hands in order to be effective. It must stay in the potter's hands. Can I just persuade you tonight to stay in the potter's hands? It doesn't matter what glitters, doesn't matter what looks like gold, you need to stay in the potter's hand. Stay in the potter's hand. I, I've often times said to you, I don't wear jewelry, just these two rings. I don't wear a watch. And guess what? I don't know if you noticed, but this 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 thing here shines. I got one that I had for more than 20 years. It doesn't shine like this. This one shines. I just got this one yesterday. Why is Sister David late? Matter of fact, this one is thicker than the one I have on every Sunday and every Wednesday. This one, this band is so much thicker than the one I wear every day. Matter of fact, let me just show you the difference in the two bands. It's different, it's different. 
I've I worn this thing for more than 20 years. And, and, and check this out. It is dull. It's skinny. It's worn. And if I put them side by side, you can tell the difference. Now, this is one you've been seeing for the last 20 years. The one right here at the top. That's, that's, that's it. Can you tell the difference in the two? The one on the top, the skinny one right there, is the one you've been seeing for the last 20 years. It doesn't shine like this one shines up. It's thinner than this one is there. This right here may have cost $250. <laughs> You have printed tassels, David? <laughs> this one may cost $250 25 years ago. $250. But it has stood the test of time. $250. And this one right here, that glitters and shine and sticker, it cost a million $17.38. I just got it this year. I said seventeen dollars, not one hundred and seventeen, not two thousand seventeen. It costs a measly seventeen dollars, and we watching it every day to see if it sit a green ring around my finger. I'm just trying to tell you, everything that glitters ain't gold. I got real gold here and fake gold there. I mean, so David's crying she laughing so hard. And let me just share with you. It doesn't matter what glitters. Doesn't matter what shine. I'm going to wait two weeks and I'm going to look at my finger. If it lasts that long. 1738 special, bro. Seven, not $17.38. Special. Somebody rob me of this, they be gonna rob me of $17.38. Y'all saw that pastor that when, when the pastor, when the, the armed robbers walked into the to, to the church and he stuck them up, they, they they took his jewelry and then they said, pull the jewelry out from under your coat or your robe. And he calculated over a million dollars worth of jewelry taken away from him. Let me just tell the word today. You're not going to get a million dollar worth. You're not going to get a quarter of a million dollar worth of jury from me. You just, it's a waste of your time. I'm more concerned about staying in the master's hand. You ought to be more concerned by staying in the master's hand. We have no ability to do what we want to do. We got to stay with God in order to do what we want to do or what God would have us to do. You got to remain in that sin. It must remain in the potter's hands in order to be so, be effective. Suppose the potter molds the clay into a cup. The cup has to remain in the potter's hand so he can use the cup to fulfill its purpose. Got to stay in the potter's hand. Now, when I since I've done all this talking, what have you concluded? Talk to me. What have you, what conclusion have you come to tonight in your own personal life? What, what is it in your personal life that you concluded from Jeremiah? Brother Whisper, I've got that look on his face. Come on, talk to me. What have you, what conclusion have you come to? Well, if, if I want to be effective, then I need to stay in God's hand. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be effective, you got to stay in the hand of God. Hey, give him that mic. Let him say that so everybody can hear. If, if you want to be effective, so I won't have to repeat everything. Well, Pastor already said, <laughs> I said if I, if I want to be effective in life, then I have to stay in God's hands. Amen. If you're going to be effective. So I can do a lot of things, right? But are those things effective? The first share in the gospel book that I wrote, I call it effective evangelism. The second one, 
is practical evangelism. The third one, sharing the gospel good news on the go, practical evangelism. We, in order to be effective, we have to stay in the hands of the manufacturer, God. How many of you have, have had a new car at one time or another? New car. One, one, two, three, all of you have had a new car at one time or another. Your first oil changed, where did you take it? To the dealer? On the tree. On the tree? <laughs> I'm talking about a brand new car now. Brand new. Brand, brand new. Your first 3,000 miles, first 5,000 miles, where did you take your car? To the dealer. To the dealer. Why y'all take it to the dealer? When, the, when, when five minute oil changed down the street? Hmm? It was free. It was free. Okay. Is that the reason y'all took it? Okay. When your alternator goes out and you got a brand new car, where are you going to take it? Your brand new car. Dealer. Dealer. Why are you going to take it to the dealer? Because it's brand new. Because they know their parts. They know, they know their parts. They know what they made. They know what they put together. And check this out. The shade tree mechanic may have not studied up on what it takes. Because now in order to change the water pump, you can't just run up there and pull the bell off and pull the water pump off and stick it back on anymore. Except some cars. <laughs> New cars, you can't do that. And now they put car engines in sideways. You may have to turn, pick the whole engine up, turn it, and take some off. That we used to just pull the belt off, pull the part off, and stick it back on. The manufacturer makes things so difficult because he or she, the dealer, wants you to bring the vehicle back to them. God is a jealous God. And God wants you to bring yourself back to him. He doesn't want you to have no other God before him. He wants you to bring it back to him. That's why you do it. Who has on page 18 these characteristics? Page 18. Brother Whitlock read that, right? Okay. When you come to God as a servant, as whose servant? As God's servant. When you come to God as God's servant, he first wants you to allow him to mold you, shape him into the instrument of God's choosing. Then he takes your life where he wills and works through it to accomplish his purpose. God takes our life. And check this out. God takes us where we are. When you come to God, he's going to take you just like you are. That's why I tell people on Sunday, don't wait till next Sunday to come to God. Come to him right now because next Sunday is not promised to you. Come to God right now because you don't know when you're leaving here. Get yourself right with the Lord right now because he can fix your problem. And not only can he fix it, he will fix it. And not only will he fix it, he's willing to fix it. God wants to fix your problem as a servant. When you come to him as a servant, he molds, he shapes you, and he deals with you. He sets his purpose forth in you. He puts his will in you. But you, like the cup, cannot do anything on your own. As the cup, you can't do anything on your own. You do not have the ability to carry out God's will except to be where he wants you to be. Are you where God wants you to be tonight? Are you where God wants you to be in your life? Are you where God wants you to be in, in your daily activities? How many of us have gotten fired from our job? When they say that we no longer have a place for you, that's firing you. When they say you don't fit anymore, that's firing you. When they say you made some drastic decisions that have cost us great pain, that's getting rid of you. How many of you have been laid off from a job? That's just a pretty word for fire. How many of you had had um, personnel reductions? That's another pretty word for fire. I remember I went to Reverend Leslie Smith and he said, man, why you didn't go to work? I said, man, I got fired. He said, don't go around telling people you got fired. 
You will lay it off. I said, dog, they told me to get out of there. <laughs> and they weren't nice about it. <laughs> they, they wouldn't, they, they said, look. I said, I said, well, you know, I'm trying to make, make sure, I'm trying to make sure Brother John's not getting my unemployment, so I want him to say the right things. I don't want him to think I'm walking away. So I asked him, are you laying me off? He wouldn't answer. Are you firing me? He wouldn't answer. He said, just know this. You don't have a home here anymore. So when I went to unemployment office, I said, he told me I didn't have a home here anymore. He said, well, tell me the conversation. I said, this was the conversation. So they write a letter to him, and he denies my unemployment. And then they write another letter to, to the manager and all three of us in the room. And guess what? They wrote two different letters, and they sitting in the same room, and they wrote two different letters two different times. And I had sense enough at age 23 to write the same letter over and over again. The same letter I wrote Brother Miles the first time, I just put it on a different stationery and wrote it again. So I got my unemployment. Well, we have to understand, we have to stay in God's hand. And when folk run us off, God is able to bless you right. on your way out the door. Yes. The last time I got laid off, it was a really a layoff, y'all. It was really a layoff in 2018. It was a layoff. They got the whole department wiped it clean, okay? So when I got laid off the last time, they asked me, did they need to walk me down to my desk to get my other stuff? I said, no, I got mine. I got a cup, a banana, and a breakfast bar. I'm ready to go now. Y'all don't know what favor y'all doing. God is really getting ready to open the door for me that no man can shut. <laughs> He's closing this door for a purpose so I can be blessed by this one. Yeah. Anybody listen to me? When you're walking and living in God's hand, God has a way of opening doors that no man can close. Let's look at the question. How much can a servant do of his and herself, by his and herself? Nothing. When God works through a servant, how much can a servant do? Everything. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Most of the time that's taken out of context. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What are the two things servants must do to be used by God? What are the two things? Number one. What's the first thing that God, that the servant must do? Brother, brother Mark. Be moldable. Be moldable. We must be moldable. We must be moldable. Every servant, if you're going to be used by God, you must be moldable. What's the second thing? We must remain in the potter's hands. We must remain in God's hand. We got to stay in the hand of God. Of God. We got to stay in God's hand. Stay in God's hand. Who has to be God's servant? Page 18 to be God's servant. Page, page 18 to be God's servant. To be God's servant, you must be moldable and remain in the hand of the master. Then the master will use you, the instrument, as he chooses. The servant can do nothing of kingdom value alone. Just as Jesus said, the son, is, the son is not able to do anything on his own. John 5 and 19 says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he does the father do. But whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. And you can do nothing without me. John 15, 5. John 15, 5, John 5, 19, John 15, 5. 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You can do nothing. With God working through a servant, however, he or she can do anything God can do. Wow, unlimited potential. Servanthood requires obedience. Servants must do what they are instructed, but must remember it's God who is accomplishing the work. So he goes from, from being a servant, being a servant as the world sees it, to being a servant of God. 
The servant must be mobile. The servant must stay in the master's hand. That the instrument that God makes us into is better than the instrument that we can think we can make ourselves into. Because Sister Brown says we got brains. We we understand things. We know things. We do things. We can think on our own. You, you hear people say all the time, God gave you five senses on your own. He gave some of us six senses. That's what people say. But the text talks about the fact that we cannot do anything on our own. John chapter 15 says we have to stay in Jesus. And, and, and John 5 and 19 declares to us that the Son is not able to do anything on Now, if Jesus cannot do anything on his own, what makes you think you're smarter than Jesus? Woo, this is good tonight. Ain't it good? What it good? This is good tonight. So Jesus has to rely on God. So we have to rely on God. Then Sister Whitlock got happy. She said, whoa, whoa, hallelujah. Unlimited potential. Sister so David started off tonight by saying, if you catch on fire for the Lord, People will travel miles to come and watch you burn. One preacher says it like this. He says, as I study the word of God and I get saturated with God's word, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, on Sunday morning, people show up to watch me burn. Look at it. He says, he says we have unlimited potential. We have unlimited potential. Servanthood requires obedience. Servers must do what they are instructed, but must remember it's God who is accomplishing the work. We got to do what God instructs us to do. But keep in mind, it's God who's doing it through you. One thing that he brings out is the word kingdom. He brings out the word kingdom. He does not focus on the church, individual churches. He focused on the kingdom. What's the difference in focusing on the church, New Beginning Church, and the kingdom? Is there a difference? If so, what is the difference? What's the difference in if we focus our potential on the church? The local building, the local body, the local bride of Christ in the kingdom. What's the difference? Is there a difference? Yes. What is the kingdom? What is the church? We know the church. We can round that off. The church is a group of baptized believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And some would say it is the bride of Christ. Others would say those who have trusted Jesus as their personal savior makes up the church. And all that's correct. Now, what is the kingdom? And how does the church parallel to the kingdom? Or do we contrast to the kingdom? Who's answering? Who's talking? I would think that the kingdom would be what the goal, the, our eternal place that we're striving to get through as Christians. Okay, so what is the kingdom on earth? I mean, what are, yeah, you're right. The kingdom is where we want to be, what God is, up yonder in heaven, on the other side. But... But what, what is the difference as we work as servants? Remember, the word is servanthood tonight. As we work as servants, how should we serve if we serve in the church? And how should we serve if we serve the kingdom? Same way. Or give me an example. Same way? Same way. What is the difference? Okay, let me break it down a little further. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I left and lived among the, the um, sand flies. I went to police to do mission work. Was that church work or kingdom work? Kingdom. What makes it kingdom work? Does it benefit the New Beginning Church? Yes, yes, let me answer that, yes. It does benefit the New Beginning Church, but it's more beneficial to the kingdom. To the entirety. What's the kingdom? The entire church, the entire kingdom of God. Whenever the word kingdom is used, there is a king. I think I said that a couple of times. Whenever we use the word kingdom, it tells us there is a king. 
Whenever we use the word kingdom, the glory goes to the king. Some people wouldn't pay $1,200 to go cross seas, to work sweat, not even to preach. We got air conditioning in here, and guess what? Every now and then, somebody put a coat on, put a sweater on, and then somebody take it off, right? That's because we got great air conditioning. Hallelujah. This year, we've had, last year, we've had great air conditioning. They didn't even break down last year. Over there, there's no air conditioning. We, we first thing we did when we got in the building, threw both doors open. Two doors over here, two doors over here, and two doors back there. All of them wide open in the evening time. Seven o'clock at night, and when you throw the doors open, the sand flies come in. In the middle of the church, you got guys from America rubbing oil on. The chairs were not cushions. The floor was not carpeted. It's kingdom work. When you do kingdom work, you make sacrifices. Boy, what could I have done with $1,200? I could have bought a $1,200 ring. <laughs> well, so today we just showed up at church to have fun tonight, didn't you? I could have bought a $1,200 ring. So today was David, how much this ring called? Seventeen, don't cut me short now. Seventeen thirty-eight. Seventeen thirty-eight. I could have brought a twelve hundred dollar ring with the money I paid to go live among the sand flies for five days. But it was kingdom work. To God be the glory for kingdom work. We're about to build in the kingdom, and whenever we have God as a king, we want to honor the king. Kingdom work. Will any of them ever come over here and join New Beginning Church? Hundreds of people came to Christ. More than that, each night came to, to receive prayer. They may not ever even visit New Beginning Church, but it's kingdom work. That's why every year we have a goal of 50 people coming to Christ, either through baptism, salvation, or membership. Now we know if people come to Christ through salvation, all those folk are not going to join New Beginning. But it's not about the New Beginning Church, it's about kingdom. Yes. That's why we do what we do, we say what we say, we act the way we act, because we're building the kingdom. Who has the last one here in this, this paragraph? I do. Okay, I do. Come on with it. Darrington. Sister Darrington, Sister Lydia Darrington has yes, it. Yes. If you have been working from the human approach to be to being a servant, this concept should change your approach to serving God. You do not get your orders and then go out to accomplish them on your own. You relate to God, respond to Him, and adjust your life to Him so that. Out of your relationship with him, he does what he wants to do through you, your life. Let's look at how God worked through his servant, Elijah. Okay, so we'll deal with Elijah next week, okay? okay. But listen to this. The human approach, the human approach to being a servant is the concept of serving God. We should change our concept. If you've been living with the human approach to serving God, tonight ought to change your concept. I told you tonight that this cup ought to change your heart. It ought, I said to you that this cup was shaped, this cup was formed, this cup was made by the potter, and this cup has to stay in the hand of the potter, and this cup will do whatever the potter says to do. This cup was polished, and it was colored by the potter. And you have to come to the conclusion that whatever color you are, whatever shade you are, God made it that way and he blessed you in it. Yes? yes. And because God has created you, you got to stay in God's hand. Amen. But when God says, if you're going to be effective, if you're going to make a difference, you got to stay in the hands of God. 
Now you can do some things and not be in God's mind. Preachers preach great messages and never stay in the hand of God. Some Sundays I walk away from here and say, man, I missed it today. And it's that Sunday when I stand at the back door or the front door and somebody said, you blessed me today. Because when you stay in the potter's hand, it's not about your dramatics. It's not about your theatrics. That's why God didn't give me a hoop. Because if I can hoop, I probably would use it for the wrong reason. Yeah. Can the church say amen? He's able. Won't he do it? Have you tried him? Brother Whitlock said, I'm glad he didn't give you that hoop. <laughs> I'm spending all of my time, all of my energy, just to say it the way the potter has said it. I want to stay in the potter's hand. When you stay in the potter's hand tonight, when you walk with God, will you allow God to tell you what to do? And next week we're going to talk about don't just do something, stand still. Don't, you know, you've heard the statement before, uh, don't just stand there. Do something. Next week we're going to talk about don't just do something. Stand there. Oh man, the author has taken us through great changes because we smart folk. Even when we love the Lord. Now, you know, you've ever seen somebody that just met the Lord, you're sitting there and everybody else going to hell but them. I mean, they just got out to doing what they were doing. Now, everybody that was doing what they were doing five minutes ago, they going to hell, and this is the only person that had going to hell. One preacher said to me, you know, and he said it when he found out that a preacher did something wrong. So this is what he says. Am I the only one living right? I said, just yes, that question tells me that you ain't living right. It tells me you stuck on yourself. It tells me that you're not in the potter's hand. You think you got it going on because it's just a matter of a split second that I can stand here, got everything in my head, everything on my paper, and nothing comes out of my mouth because it's the potter. The potter is the one that allows me to think. The potter is the one that allows me to do what I do. The potter is the one that gives me the spirit. Just like this cup, I think it's so Brown that said, the potter has made this cup, but the cup doesn't have a spirit. And I could be just like this cup. I know some people that were smart last year, and they can't even remember their name today. You better stop telling stay in the potter's hand. And you don't have to get old. You don't have to get old to realize that God is keeping your mind. You, you could be like... Uh, you can be like never check neither. He, he's crawling on the ground eating grass like a cow. He's crawling on the ground eating grass like a cow because, because he did not stay in God's hand. Jesus has made a way for us to stay in his hand. Jesus died for us over 2,000 years ago. He formed us. He made us who we are. He saved us. He delivered us. So that we can stay in the potter's hand. We can't even stay in the potter's hand on our own accord. We don't have the strength to do it. Because Paul says every time I look up, there's some temptation. And somebody had to fight through temptation and get here tonight. Don't raise your hand, don't look around. Somebody had to fight through some trouble to get here tonight. Somebody had, had the devil on their shoulders. What they want, the devil went whispering in your ear. He was hollering. Don't do it. You don't feel good tonight. You've been through some stuff this weekend. You don't need to go down there to that church. Somebody that's online didn't want to even get online tonight. Because the devil said don't do it. But Jesus made it possible. For us to have hope, for us to have strength, and for us to press our way through. Let me tell you, if you press your way through and stay in the potter's hand, God can bless you. Press your way through. Press your way through. I have come to the pulpit before, 
I mean, just sick. And then I did all I could to keep my breakfast down. That breakfast bar. I did all I could to keep it down. But I had to press my way through. In the midst of service. Let me tell you, I didn't want to face those sand flies another day. So the first morning I got up, I had lotioned myself down with that sand. And the guys made fun of me. I walked out there for breakfast, and God said, I can tell you've been in that hall this morning. <laughs> After a couple, couple bites from the sand flies, I lotioned myself down. I mean, they, I asked the question three times. Do I put it in my face? He said, if you want your face bit, don't put it in your face. I came out there looking like a grease monkey. <laughs> Jesus has made a way for us on Calvary. He died for us. He was buried for us. And he rose for us. And tonight, there may be somebody who have never received Jesus as your personal Savior. This is your moment. If you would, just bow your head with me and invite Jesus in. Believe in the story that Jesus died on Calvary. He was buried in a barber tomb. And he rose from the dead. If you can believe this story tonight, you can be born again. You can be saved just as you are. Just repeat this simple prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe that you honestly pray this prayer of trusting that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sin. We believe that you're born again. And we would like to know that you received Christ as your Savior. Inbox us and let us know that you have received him. And if you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Let us know if you want to join the New Beginning Church, whether you're locally or globally positioned. We would like to have you as a member of our church. It's now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do so by giving by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Zelle is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can mail it in to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Thank you for joining us tonight here at the New Beginning Church. We're located at 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas. That's 4251 Shiramai. Shiramai is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. S-C-H-U-R. M-I-E-R, Shiremont Road, Houston, Texas, 77040, Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of it. If you need an envelope, raise your hand and you will be served. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for these gifts. We thank you for every giver. We ask you, Father God, to bless us in our going, bless our lives, that our lives will be in your hands. Bless us, Father God, tonight that as we leave this place, we will never leave your presence. Bless us to be moldable, Father God, and bless us to stay in your hand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Please remember those of you over age 62, meet us here Saturday at 2.15 uh, p.m. Those of you who are over the age of 62, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if you're over the age of 62, come on out. We're going to fellowship big time in a big way on this Saturday. Amen. Thank you.